Today, we will be talking about schema theory. Schema theory is something that doesn't actually come from pedagogy, but actually comes from the sister field of uh, psychology. And it's something that's really important for us to know, especially learning about the receptive skills, because it's something that's really intertwined. And we, when we talk about the receptive skills and reading and listening being interactive processes, one of the things that is happening in the brain is that you are interpreting all the information that you're gathering from reading or listening through some sort of filter. Um, and that is what, what schema is. Uh, schema is your filter for life, but that's what we're going to talk about right now. So let's get on to the presentation. Um, and even if this is something that comes from psychology, it's very important for our field in teaching. So let's talk about schema theory. And we have here on the first slide, it says schema theory. And then on the bottom, it says schemata. Schemata is the singular and schema is the plural. So basically, schemata are used to organize knowledge, assist recall, guide behavior, predict likely happenings, and help to make sense of current experiences. So what does that mean? I know that sounds very uh, technical, but let's talk about what that exactly means. So what is schema and what is it for? Um, basically, schema is the complex cognitive structures created by a person uh, commonly referred to as background knowledge. So when we talk about schema and when we talk about background knowledge, we're pretty much talking about the same thing, though schema is a much bigger concept than background knowledge. For example, when we talk about activating background knowledge when teaching a, a lesson, that is just a little piece of what schema is. So schema is really what we use to process the world around us. It is the color of the lens with which we see things. Now, a good story to exemplify this is the story of a child driving down the road uh, in a car with his parents. And for the first time ever, he looks out the window and he sees a, a, a cow. Uh, he'd never seen a cow before in his life. Um, and he looks at the cow. This is a child of about four, maybe three, four, five years old. Uh, and he looks at the cow and he says, Mommy, look, a dog. And you think, well, he's wrong, right? Uh, why? How can he confuse a, a, a dog and a cow? It's not the same animal. However, he'd never seen a cow before, but he saw this animal. It had four legs, you know, it had a tail, it had a, a head. So for him, the closest thing he could interpret that animal was, was actually a dog, right? So he used this lens of, of his previous experiences to be able to interpret the world around him. So when we talk about schema, it, it's that. It's, it's everything that makes you who you are that helps you interpret the world around us. So if we talk about why schema is a bigger concept than just simple background knowledge, it's because schema can be divided into different categories. So for example, there's social schema, and it's everything that you learn from social um, interactions, right? So everything that's that's generated in social cultural events. So for example, if you grew up in one country and you go to another country where the, where the customs are different, where the culture is different, um, you may have awkward situations. Right, because you are used to doing things the way in which you do them because of your experience with social situations, but in another country they do something different. Right, so um, it's it's how you move yourself around the culture. Um, for example, leaving food on the plate is a very good example. Do you leave food on the plate or do you not? Let me tell you another short story. For example, so there's there's this one person. Uh, he went to this other country. He was an American, goes to another country, um, and he gets served a big plate of food. And uh, at the end of that plate of food, um, he, he was really full, right? But he finished up to the last uh, bite on that plate uh, because obviously he thought it was rude to leave food uh, on the plate, uh, especially if they were inviting him, right? So he finishes and boom, they serve him a second time. 
And he's like, oh my God, I can't say no, right? So he finishes that and he doesn't want to leave any food on the plate. And, and he's having a really hard time with that second plate, but he goes ahead and just finishes that second plate. Um, and then as soon as he's finished the last bite, boom, he gets served a third time. And he's like, why, are, why do you keep serving me? I, I've had more than enough. And then the lady of the house explained that in that country, you're supposed to leave food on your plate to mean that you're completely full and you can't eat anymore and you don't want any food. Because if you leave nothing on the plate, it means you can still eat. So that's a clash between cultures. Uh, but at the same time, it's each person was doing what they knew how to do. Each person was acting from their own social schema. There's also ideological schema, which is basically generated by attitudes or opinions, like, for example, political issues. Uh, so, for example, if you are uh, a Republican or a Democrat, you will see the same issue differently, like, for example, the issue of, of abortion or the issue of ecology. So it's the ideas that you've grown up with that actually shape how you see things. Uh, there's also formal schema, which is related to the rhetorical structures of, of language, of written texts. Uh, so, for example, you don't talk to your boss the same way in which you talk to a friend, right? And, and that you know because you have that schemata in you, right, that you've learned from what's gone on in the world. So, basically, you record this experiences from the world and you understand that that's how the world works and you work according to what you know. Uh, there's also linguistic schema, which is everything that you know about language. Um, so it's how much language you know, how you understand how words are organized and how they fit together in a sentence, uh, whether it's spoken or written. So understanding that linguistic part is also like knowing vocabulary. That's part of your linguistic schema, the words that you know. Um, arranging... Um, Arranging sentences, that's also part of your schema. And there's also a content schema, which refers to knowledge about the subject matter or the content of a text. So how much do you know about a certain subject matter? That would be part of your schema as well, of your content schema. So you're an English teacher, for example, how much do you know about English itself? Or if you're a gardener, how much do you know about gardening? Right? Um, how much do you know when to plant, when to water, and all these other things? So if we think about schema and we think about reading and listening, students will use their schema to process texts by combining their background knowledge or their schemata with the information from the text to comprehend it. And when I mean text, it could be a written text or a spoken text, you know, so, so a spoken conversation or, or a recorded conversation. But basically, you're using this background information to be able to comprehend it by developing the coherent interpretation of that piece of writing or listening according to the schemata. Let me give you an example. Imagine a seven-year-old boy reading a book about two boys fighting over a girl. Now, this seven-year-old boy basically will not understand the story. Why? Because for a seven-year-old, girls are yucky, right? So it's really not about if he understands or not, but his schema hasn't given him that experience so that he can understand. If you give that piece of writing to a couple of teenagers, then you'll have people siding with one guy or people siding with the other one, and it's Team Jacob and Team whoever, you, you know what I'm talking about? So it's basically you, you, you're you part of that experience because you lived it somehow. It's that schema you have that is helping you interpret the text. If you don't have that schema, then you can't interpret the text. Another example is maybe nowadays it's more common in Guatemala for people to leave their household when they are when they're a certain age, uh, but it's still not a thing, right? In Guatemala, usually you leave your home when you get married and sometimes you get divorced and then you move back home with your parents, right? So that's completely normal. But if you give some, some teenagers um, a book about someone 
becoming 18 and leaving home, they might not understand that because they're going to think, why is he leaving home? Because you don't leave home. I'm sure that the only reason that he's leaving home is because he probably hates his parents or he got into a fight with his parents, right? Because they don't have that cultural schema and that idea that in the United States, you're supposed to leave home when you're 18. Maybe that doesn't happen so much anymore. And the idea is that if you don't understand that culturally, that if you don't have that schema, you're not able to process a text to understand what's happening. And that is the value of schema. So right now, I'm going to take a pause. This ends part one. And then in part two, we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit further about what schema is.